In Akron, Ohio, June is typically the gloomiest and wettest month of the year. But on one particular morning in June of 2001, when Akron resident Jeff Zack poked his head out of his bedroom window, he was thrilled to discover that the sun was out and the sky was clear. Jeff immediately rushed to his closet to change into his yard work clothes. He pulled on a t-shirt and then he zipped up a pair of beat up old cargo shorts and then he raced down the stairs, grabbed his pruning shears and then dashed out the back door without even putting his shoes on. On the stoop behind his house, the 44 year old gardening enthusiast slash professional landscaper paused briefly to admire his work. Although Jeff's backyard was a pretty standard size and shape for an American house in the suburbs, it was filled with lush green grass that was always perfectly cut and around the perimeter of the yard, Jeff had planted the colorful rose bushes that were just about to reach their peak bloom. After stepping down the few back steps, Jeff began marching across his beautiful grass toward his rose bushes to do some pruning. As he walked along, he smiled to himself, feeling certain he must have the best landscaping in the whole neighborhood. Jeff was a very competitive guy, and so he loved being the best at things. But as much as he'd love to say that he had some kind of magical touch with plants, the truth was Jeff just understood how plants worked. Give them the right mixture of sunlight, soil, and water, and plants will reward you with fruit and flowers. Simple. But as Jeff lifted his pruning shears to make the first cut, he heard his wife Bonnie calling to him from the kitchen about breakfast being ready, and he was instantly reminded that people were not like plants. People were complicated. You could give them everything they ever thought they wanted and still they'd be miserable. And as Jeff cut back the errant stems of his rose bush, he thought about how his relationship with Bonnie was a perfect example of this. Jeff and Bonnie had gotten married 15 years ago. At the time, they wanted the same things in life, stability and family, and they were both very physically attracted to each other. So logically speaking, their marriage should have worked out perfectly, but it didn't, at least not to Jeff. Even though Bonnie had given Jeff the family and the stability he'd always wanted, and she still was very attractive to him, there were still times when Jeff just could not stand to look at her. And sometimes just the sound of her voice, even when she was doing something nice, like that morning calling out to him to let him know that she had made him breakfast, was like nails on a chalkboard for Jeff. And not because Bonnie was a bad person or bad wife, really it was the opposite. She was a great wife who'd given him everything he thought he wanted, but still Jeff just felt unhappy. And unfortunately, his unhappiness had led to bitter resentment of his wife. However, recently, Jeff had begun telling himself that it was him who needed to make changes, not his wife. And so over the last month, Jeff had been making a very conscious effort to be kinder, more patient, and less hot-headed when he was around his wife and also his son. But every day was a struggle. After cutting one more stem on his rose bush, Jeff stood up and walked back over to the door leading into the house. He paused just outside of it and took a few deep breaths to calm down. He knew he felt annoyed with his wife for really no other reason than he heard her voice. But he told himself today he would do his best to be a better husband and a better father. Jeff wiped his feet on the mat and then he opened the door and stepped inside. Less than an hour later, Jeff had fallen back into his old angry ways and was screaming at his wife Bonnie for no apparent reason and saying he wanted a divorce. Moments later, Jeff was storming outside, slamming the front door behind him. Once outside, Jeff clambered into his Ford Explorer SUV parked in the driveway and after firing the engine up, he flew out of the driveway and just started driving. For the next couple of hours, Jeff drove around the city aimlessly, honking at yelling at other drivers and just kind of generally taking out his anger on anyone who happened to come near him. But at a certain point during this kind of crazed drive around town, Jeff realized he actually had a lot of errands he needed to run, so he decided he would start doing those. Jeff usually had a lot of errands to run because he worked in a lot of different businesses. In addition to professionally landscaping, Jeff also worked as a handyman, he did some flooring work, and he also owned and operated a slew of vending machines around town. As Jeff was getting ready to head to a hardware store for his first errand, he looked down and he realized he was very low on gas. So instead of going to the hardware store, Jeff decided he would go to BJ's. 
BJ's is a big American wholesale store, and it's where Jeff went every Saturday to buy items for his various vending machines. BJ's also had their own gas station right out front near the parking lot, so Jeff figured he could get the gas he needed for his car and then also knock out a vending machine refill run. When Jeff arrived out front of BJ's and looked at the parking lot and the gas station, he was immediately struck by how crowded the place seemed. Now, BJ's is a very popular store, and the parking lot is usually full of people, but this day it just seemed like there were way more people than usual. But when Jeff looked at his watch and saw the date, he knew why. It was Saturday, June 16th, the day before Father's Day, and so most likely, all these people were here getting all the things they would need for their celebration the next day. Things like hot dogs and hamburgers, chips, soda, lawn chairs, charcoal for grills. Father's Day is a big cookout day in the US. And as Jeff thought about Father's Day, his heart sunk. What a terrible father and husband he had been that morning, yelling at his wife and slamming the door on the way out. Suddenly, all Jeff wanted to do was rush home, say he was sorry, and give his wife and son a big hug. So he whipped his Ford Explorer into the gas station right up alongside an open pump, and as quick as he could, he got to work getting the nozzle into his car to start filling up. There were so many vehicles moving in and out of the gas station that Jeff didn't even notice the motorcyclist in the full-faced helmet pull up right behind him. After filling his car's tank and then putting the pump back in the holster, Jeff climbed back inside of his car. And there, sitting behind the wheel, Jeff glanced over at all the happy families buzzing around the BJ's parking lot, loading their Father's Day celebration goods into their cars. And as he watched, Jeff felt another pang of regret about how he had acted that morning. Luckily, he'd be home soon, he could apologize, and maybe even salvage a fun Father's Day the next day. But before Jeff could fire up his car's engine, the motorcyclist in the full-faced helmet that had pulled up behind Jeff walked up to Jeff's driver's side window. Jeff noticed him and looked up at him through his window very inquisitively, and as he did this, the motorcyclist casually raised a 38 caliber handgun from his waist, he aimed it at the glass, and fired a single shot directly into Jeff's face. Jeff's head fell forward onto the car's horn. And suddenly, between the sound of the gunshot and the sound of Jeff's car horn, which was now just blaring constantly, everyone at the gas station and in the nearby BJ's parking lot was thrown into a sudden panic. That is, everyone except for the motorcyclist who had just shot Jeff. While everyone else was screaming and running around and trying to figure out what was going on, the motorcyclist simply turned around, walked calmly back to their bike, and then rode away from the scene as if nothing happened. One of the people who actually saw the shooting take place was the gas station attendant, and within 30 seconds of the shooting, this attendant was on the phone with 911. But by that point, it was already too late for Jeff. He was dead. Jeff had been murdered in front of dozens of people in one of the most crowded shopping centers in the city, and yet, when police arrived just a few minutes after the 911 call, they would discover that not a single witness could actually identify the shooter. In fact, nobody could even say for sure if the shooter was a man or a woman. All that anyone could remember was that the motorcyclist had been wearing a full-faced helmet and that they were riding a green and white ninja motorcycle. Given the cold-blooded nature of the murder and the fact that it was done in broad daylight in public, the police knew it was only a matter of time before the news of what happened found its way to the victim's family, Jeff's family. To ensure that that was not how the family learned about Jeff's death, not long after arriving on scene and identifying Jeff, police officers radioed back to the station to tell the chief that someone needed to go to Jeff's house ASAP to break the news. Fifteen minutes later, a pair of detectives arrived in front of Jeff's perfectly landscaped two-story home. And when Jeff's wife, Bonnie, opened the door, the police were apologetic but direct. They told the 46-year-old woman what happened to her husband and asked if she knew of anyone who might want to hurt him. Bonnie leaned against the doorframe as if it was the only thing holding her up. It was clear that Bonnie was shocked by the news of her husband's death but, as Bonnie would tell the detectives, she was not exactly surprised by it. For one thing, Bonnie said, Jeff had a lot of enemies. In fact, Jeff seemed to make enemies wherever he went, 
He was an aggressive and deeply unhappy person who seemed to enjoy being confrontational. So as far as Bonnie was concerned, it was definitely possible that Jeff had been killed by someone he had upset. But Bonnie was quick to tell police that she did not think her husband had been killed by a total stranger. Before saying another word, Bonnie scanned the street out front and then invited the detectives to come inside her house where she could explain why she thought this was no random attack. The detectives followed Bonnie into her kitchen and once they were all seated around the table, Bonnie told them that she believed her husband knew he was going to be killed. She said about a month earlier, Jeff had started acting different. Bonnie admitted that for years, Jeff had been emotionally and physically abusive with her. He also cheated on her constantly and sometimes as recently as that morning, he threatened to divorce her. But lately, Bonnie told them, he'd been generally kinder to her, all things considered, which was very noticeable. And he had also begun saying strange things to her that seemed to indicate that he thought he was going to die soon. Bonnie said that three weeks earlier, Jeff had taken her down into their basement to show her where he kept his financial papers. Bonnie asked him why he was showing this to her now, all of a sudden, after 15 years of marriage, and Jeff just said it was because he wanted her to know where to find things in case he wasn't around to provide for them. Bonnie thought this was totally ridiculous because her husband seemed totally healthy, and so she didn't think much of it. However, Bonnie told the detectives that just a few days ago, someone had called their house and left a voicemail for Jeff. It was a man who just kept demanding to speak with Jeff, and his tone very obviously suggested he was not happy with Jeff. Bonnie had saved the voicemail and wound up playing it right there in the kitchen for the detectives. And after the short message was over, they agreed that whoever was calling sounded very threatening. Bonnie told detectives that when Jeff came home on the night that this voicemail came through, she immediately played it for Jeff and then asked him who was that. Bonnie would tell detectives that as Jeff listened to this recording, he looked visibly frightened by whoever was on the phone. But he would say to Bonnie that he didn't know who it was or what they wanted and that Bonnie should just forget about it and move on. But Bonnie could tell her husband was lying. It seemed obvious to her that Jeff knew who this guy was. He knew what he wanted, and he just didn't want to tell her. This information was obviously very interesting to the detectives, but the most interesting thing they would hear while visiting Jeff's house was not this recording or anything Bonnie said. Instead, it was something Jeff and Bonnie's 12-year-old son said. While Bonnie and the detectives sat at the kitchen table talking, Bonnie and Jeff's son came into the house, and after he was told what happened to his father, he was absolutely devastated, but after composing himself, he told police that he might know who killed his father. He said just one night earlier, he had been watching TV with his dad, when out of the blue, his dad, Jeff, turned to him and said, if anything happens to me, Ed George did it. At the mention of this name, Ed George, the detective's ears perked straight up because they knew who Ed George was. In fact, pretty much anyone who lived in Akron, Ohio knew who Ed George was. Ed was one of the wealthiest men in Akron and he owned one of the city's most popular institutions, a place called Tangier. Tangier was part restaurant, part nightclub, and part banquet hall. And over the years, it had played host to major celebrities and personalities, ranging from the Beach Boys to Tina Turner to President George H.W. Bush, and years later, his son, President George W. Bush. There had always been rumors that some of Ed's wealth might be tied to organized crime, but those rumors had never been substantiated. And as far as anyone could tell, Ed was an upstanding citizen. He was an active member of the Catholic Church and a devoted father of seven kids. So why had Jeff told his son that Ed might hurt him someday? After talking for a while with the son and with Bonnie, the detectives left for the night. The next morning, when the detectives went into the station, they told their colleagues about what Jeff had told his son about Ed George. And in that moment, one of the detectives, a guy named Paul Callahan, suddenly remembered a strange interaction he'd had with Ed about six months back. Paul had known Ed for years. Paul was in an Irish folk band that used to play at Ed's restaurant, Tangier, every St. Patrick's Day, 
So it wasn't weird for Paul to get a social call from Ed every once in a while. But six months ago, when Ed called Paul on his office line at the police station, it was not for a social call. On this call, Ed told Paul that some guy had been harassing his wife, Cindy. Paul asked Ed if he knew who this guy was, and Ed said yes. Paul said, okay, who is it? But Ed said he didn't want to tell Paul. He also said he didn't want to file a police report. At first, Paul was confused by this, but he sensed that maybe Ed was just looking for some advice on how to handle the situation on his own. So Paul told Ed to just go confront the guy and tell him to leave Cindy alone. Ed said, okay, thank you, and then they both hung up. Now, normally, Paul might have just forgotten about a call like this, except this was not the only time Ed called Paul about this guy who was harassing his wife. In fact, just two weeks earlier, so roughly five months after this first call Paul got from Ed, and only two weeks before Jeff's murder, Ed called Paul again to say this guy was still harassing Cindy. After Paul finished telling his colleagues about these strange calls he got from Ed, the whole police department quickly began to wonder if maybe the guy who was harassing Ed's wife was actually Jeff, and maybe Ed did confront Jeff about it, and in the process of this confrontation, Ed killed Jeff. Regardless, the police knew they needed to figure out why Jeff had told his son that he thought Ed was going to hurt him. And who better to ask than Ed himself? So the next day, a team of four detectives drove out to Ed George's house, located 20 miles outside of Akron. The house was actually more like a compound. It sat on 18 acres of land and was made up of two big buildings. There was the main house, which was a whopping 8,000 square feet, and then there was the second house, which was a separate four-bedroom home just for Ed and Cindy's servants. The detectives had all heard about how big Ed's property was, but when they turned off the main road and began driving up Ed's long driveway, they were all stunned by the sheer size of everything. The detectives reached the end of the driveway and parked right near the front steps of the main house. Then they climbed out of their vehicle and walked up to the front door and they knocked. A moment later, they heard shuffling feet coming from inside the house, then the door slowly opened and the detectives were met with one of the George family's nannies. After the nanny said a quick hello, she asked the detectives what they were doing there. And when they explained the situation, the nanny said that Ed was actually not home at the moment, he was out golfing and wouldn't be back for a while. But she said Ed's wife, Cindy, was home if they wanted to talk to her. The detectives tried to act casual. They said, okay, yeah, sure, we'll talk to Cindy. But secretly, the detectives were actually thrilled about the prospect of talking to Ed's wife without Ed around to supervise. The detectives knew Cindy from Tangier. She often acted as the hostess. She was warm and charismatic, and she was also extremely beautiful. In fact, just one year earlier, Cindy had placed third in the Mrs. Ohio America pageant. But when 47-year-old Cindy emerged from her wing of the house, she looked extremely frail and broken down. The mother of seven smiled a weak smile and then invited the detectives to join her in one of the family's large sitting rooms. Once they were all settled in, detectives explained that they were there to ask some questions about the death of Jeff Zack. Cindy was nervous, but she told them she would do her best to answer all of their questions. When asked what her husband, Ed, had been doing on the morning that Jeff was murdered, she said he had spent the entire morning at Tangier dealing with a drainage issue. As for her own whereabouts that morning, Cindy said that she was at home with her seven kids getting everybody ready to go to a friend's wedding that was being held later that afternoon. When the detectives eventually shifted the conversation and asked Cindy directly if Jeff had been the person who was harassing her, Cindy seemed taken aback that they knew about that, but after taking a breath, she looked down and said, yes, he was. Cindy said that Jeff had actually been a friend of the family for many years, but at some point earlier that year, he just started calling the house incessantly asking to talk to Cindy. When asked, Cindy said she did not know why Jeff was calling so much or what he wanted to talk to her about, but she didn't say it confidently, 
And as she said this, she looked kind of troubled. To the detectives, it seemed like Cindy might be hiding something about Jeff, but she also seemed totally scared about it. So the detectives very gently followed up with another similar question to try to figure out what Cindy knew. They said, well, even if you don't know why he was calling you, could you maybe just take a guess as to what he wanted? Cindy looked down at her hands as if the answer to this question was written somewhere on them. And then after a long pause, she looked back up at the detectives and shook her head before telling them again she just didn't know. The detectives felt confident that Cindy did know more about Jeff than she was letting on, but they got the feeling that she was not going to open up much more that day. So they very politely wrapped up the conversation, thanked Cindy for her time, and then they made their way back outside to their car and headed back to the station. The next morning, Paul called his old friend Ed and asked him if he wouldn't mind coming into the station so they could ask him some questions about Jeff Sachs' murder. Ed responded by saying, of course, me and Cindy will be there soon. But neither Ed nor Cindy would come down to the police station that day. Instead, about an hour after that phone call with Paul, Ed's lawyer showed up at the police station and walked straight up to Paul's desk and informed the detective that his client, Ed George, would not be participating in this investigation. The lawyer then turned around and left. Paul was stunned. He felt like if Ed was innocent, he never would have sent his lawyer in like that. But without evidence tying Ed to Jeff's murder, there was really nothing the police could do. Over the next few weeks, the police tried calling Ed and Cindy's friends and relatives in the hopes that someone would be willing to shed some light on what happened between Ed and Cindy and Jeff. But one after another, Ed's friends and family all declined to speak with law enforcement and just told the detectives to speak with their lawyers instead. And these lawyers, the detectives would discover, were all being paid for by Ed. But again, despite how guilty Ed looked, without evidence, there was really nothing police could do about Ed or how he was conducting himself. So the detectives had to go back to the drawing board. They spent days reviewing the crime scene photos and reading witness statements and playing Bonnie's voicemail tape over and over again, but none of that got them anywhere. And then one day, the detectives realized they'd missed something. The detectives were sitting around at a conference table talking in circles about the case when one of the detectives picked up a photo of the George family and this detective immediately noticed something. In this photo were Ed and Cindy and their seven kids. Two of their kids were adopted and so of course they looked nothing like Ed or Cindy. But as this detective stared at this photo, they noticed that four of the five biological children looked exactly like Ed and Cindy. But the fifth biological child, the youngest, the eight-year-old, looked nothing like Ed or Cindy. Instead, this youngest child looked just like the murder victim, Jeff Zack. The detective who noticed this turned the photo around to show her colleagues, and after looking it over, they all agreed. And if this eight-year-old child was indeed Jeff's child, not Ed's, then the child was clear evidence of an affair happening between Cindy and Jeff, which would give Jeff a reason for wanting to call Cindy all the time, and it would give Ed a motive for wanting to kill Jeff. When the detectives brought this theory to the county prosecutor's office, they agreed there was enough evidence to get a warrant that would force the Georges to take a paternity test. So that's what they did. The warrant was issued, and on August 24, 2001, a little more than two months after Jeff's murder, Ed and Cindy, along with the eight-year-old youngest child, arrived in a doctor's office to take a court-ordered DNA test. And sure enough, when the results came back three weeks later, it would show that Jeff was the father of this child, not Ed. The George family was notified by phone, so the detectives didn't get to see how Ed or Cindy reacted to the news. But when the results of this paternity test made it to the local press, people were absolutely shocked. Ed and Cindy were like local celebrities, and they seemed like the perfect couple. So this news about Cindy's affair quickly swept through the city, and soon locals would begin openly speculating about the possibility that Ed had hired a hitman to murder his wife's lover, Jeff. 
And it wasn't just the locals who thought this was what happened. The police also suspected that this was a professional hit. And so they began scouring Ed's phone records, his bank statements, and questioned every Tangier employee willing to speak to them in order to find the evidence they needed that proved Jeff's murder was an assassination paid for by Ed. But after months of looking, they found nothing. And so it was starting to look like this case was going to go cold. However, about one year after the murder, a new tip would come into the station that would lead the detectives in a roundabout way to the home of a 40-year-old single mother named Christine Todero, and she would break the case wide open. Christine seemed to have no apparent connection to the case, but she believed that her ex-husband was the masked motorcycle-riding hitman, the man who killed Jeff Zack. And the reason she believed this was because one time when she was speaking on the phone with her ex, he made this joke about him being the killer. But Christine suspected he was not actually joking because during her brief marriage to him, 35-year-old John Zafino had been violent and dangerous. In fact, Christine left him because he punched her 13-year-old son in the face and in a separate incident, broke Christine's arm intentionally. When Christine listened to the mysterious voicemail that Jeff's wife Bonnie had shown police, where some guy was demanding to speak to Jeff, Christine's eyes shot wide open and she said, yes, 100%, that is my ex-husband, John. After that, detectives would run a search on any and all vehicles registered in John's name, and by noon, they had a full report in their hands. Everybody at the station got a copy of this report, and together, the detectives reviewed it line by line, scanning for anything that could tie John to Jeff's murder. And within minutes, the detectives found what they were looking for. According to the report, in May of 2001, less than one month before Jeff's murder, John had purchased a motorcycle from a dealership outside of Akron. And when police called that dealership, the manager told them that the bike John had purchased was a black ninja-style bike with a green stripe, just like the one ridden by the person who killed Jeff. Detectives would also discover that in that same month, John had also purchased a weapon, a 38 caliber handgun, the same kind of gun that killed Jeff. But while John certainly looked like the prime murder suspect, there were still two questions the detectives were struggling to answer. The first was, why would John do this? There was no connection between him and Jeff whatsoever. So was he just a hitman, potentially hired by Ed? Nobody knew. The second question was, how could John afford the very expensive motorcycle and gun? The police had done a lot of digging on John and they knew he did not have very much money. In fact, John was so deep in debt, he couldn't even afford his own apartment. The police would spend months searching for the answers to these two general questions, and by the time John was arrested in September of 2002, detectives would be convinced that both of these questions actually had the same answer. And that answer was Sparky. Sparky was the nickname John had given to a woman he met one night in the summer of 2000, about a year before Jeff's murder. That summer, John was standing outside of a restaurant in Akron when he saw this woman, Sparky, walking toward her car. She was beautiful, she was alone, and to John, she looked really sad. So John walked up to her and started a conversation. And quickly, in this conversation, Sparky would tell John that she was married, to which he said he didn't care because he was married too, to Christine. John reached into his pocket and pulled out an old gum wrapper and then wrote his phone number on it, and then he handed the paper to Sparky and asked her to please call him that night after she got home so he would know she arrived safely. Sparky would indeed call John later that night when she got home, and they would chat for a while, nothing more. But not long after this first interaction, Sparky began sneaking off from her husband to go meet up with John. Now, at the time, John did not have a steady source of income or an apartment of his own. So, not long after they met, Sparky moved John into an apartment that she paid for where they could spend the nights alone together. She also paid all of John's other bills and bought him a cell phone so she could reach him whenever she wanted. 
It was an extremely passionate love affair, but they both talked openly about the future and how maybe there was some way for them to be together long term. However, Sparky made it very clear that no matter what, she would never, ever leave her husband. Before she married her husband, she had nothing. She was a poor coal miner's daughter living in a 200 square foot house with three other people. But now through her husband, she had a home and she had some nice things. And so she was not prepared to give any of that up. However, things in Sparky's married life were far from perfect, as John would find out one night in January of 2001, roughly six months after meeting Sparky. That January night, Sparky called John hysterically crying. She told him that an ex-boyfriend of hers was giving her serious problems. It would turn out John was not the first man Sparky had had an affair with. It would also turn out that this other guy was not technically Sparky's ex-boyfriend, at least not yet. Sparky had been seeing this other guy for nearly a decade, and she had tried to break it off with him many times in the past, but each time he always figured out a way to rope her back in. But now that Sparky was with John, she finally had the courage to tell this other guy that it was really over. And so she had told him that she did not want to see him again or have any contact with him whatsoever. And this made the now ex-boyfriend absolutely furious. He started threatening to hurt Sparky and her children, and he threatened to expose their secret relationship to the public. Sparky was terrified and didn't know what to do. John's reaction to all of this was not being upset with Sparky for seeing another man. Instead, John's reaction was fear. He was scared that if this ex-boyfriend exposed Sparky, then Sparky's husband would divorce her and suddenly Sparky wouldn't have all that money that she got from her husband. And so Sparky would not be able to pay for John's life. Because remember, Sparky is paying for John's apartment. She's paying all his bills. I mean, she's paying for everything. And so John couldn't have that happen. He needed to make sure Sparky and her husband stayed married for his sake. And so naturally, a plan was made to murder Sparky's very troublesome ex-boyfriend, whose real name was Jeff Zack. No one knows for sure if Sparky or John initiated this murder plan, but what investigators do know is that in May of 2001, about one month before Jeff Zack was murdered, Sparky withdrew $5,300 from her bank account. And then three hours later, John used that same amount of money to buy the black ninja style bike with the green stripe. Also that same month, John purchased a handgun from one of his colleagues at the trucking company where he worked. A couple weeks after that, John quit his job at the trucking company because, as John told one of his colleagues, his girlfriend was going to be, quote, setting him up in business. One week later, on Saturday, June 17th, 2001, the day before Father's Day, John suited up in full body leather and put on a full-faced motorcycle helmet over his head. Then he rode his brand new motorcycle to BJ's Wholesale to wait for Jeff. John knew that Jeff would most likely swing by BJ's at some point that day because usually on Saturdays, Jeff would go to BJ's to buy candy to restock his vending machines. And so at 11.49 a.m., Sparky, a.k.a. Cindy George, mother of seven, called her lover and hitman, John, on the cell phone she had bought for him. The pair talked on the phone while John rode in circles on his motorcycle around the BJ's parking lot, hoping, praying that Jeff would show up. That call would end at 11.56, just as John spotted Jeff pulling into the parking lot in his Ford Explorer. As Jeff pulled up to one of the gas pumps, John pulled up right behind him. Then after Jeff had fueled his vehicle and gotten back inside, John got off his motorcycle, pulled the handgun out of his saddlebag, and then walked right up to Jeff's driver's side window, aimed his gun, and fired a single shot directly into Jeff's face. In the confusion that followed, John managed to hop back on his motorcycle and ride quickly away from the scene without being followed. About 20 minutes later, when he'd reached a safe distance from the crime scene, he called Cindy again. We don't know exactly what was said on that call, but it's assumed that on this call, John told Cindy that he had just killed Jeff 
and that she no longer had to worry about her marriage to Ed falling apart. But, of course, whatever peace that murder brought for Cindy and John was short-lived. Because in June of 2003, almost exactly two years after Jeff was murdered, John was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Cindy would be arrested a year and a half after John went to jail, and then 11 months after her arrest, Cindy would be convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and sentenced to life in prison as well. However, Cindy's conviction would not stand. Less than two years after being sentenced, her conviction was overturned on appeal. The justices ruled that the evidence presented in her trial was insufficient to prove her guilt. And so, on March 22, 2007, almost six years after the murder of Jeff Zack, Cindy George was released from prison. And waiting for her outside the prison walls were her seven kids and her husband, Ed. After a long, tearful embrace, the family hopped into a car and took Cindy back to their giant estate outside of Akron, where she and her family still live. Chichijima is a small Japanese island about 500 miles south of the Japanese mainland. During World War II, the Japanese put a base on this island, and they put two radio towers at the top of the two mountains on the island. These radio towers became integral to the Japanese communication and surveillance operations in the Pacific during the war. And so at that time, the island was heavily fortified with up to 25,000 troops and huge anti-aircraft guns. Because of the island's obvious strategic value to Japan, the Americans wanted to take it from them. But American military strategists advised against that, saying that any amphibious landing of this island would result in massive casualties for Americans, and the Japanese would likely just repel the attack anyways. And so the Americans decided to go with the next best thing, which was to attempt to bomb the two towers and cut out their communications. So in June of 1944, American aircraft carriers, which are those huge, huge ships that planes can take off of and land on, they headed for the island of Chichijima. And once the island was completely surrounded, the Americans began launching their pilots to try to take out these towers. But the Japanese fought back in a major way. And despite taking heavy casualties on their side, they repelled every American air raid and kept them from bombing their towers. After several months of these failed missions over Chichijima, the American military leaders were incredibly frustrated. They knew this was going to be a difficult mission, but they didn't expect it to be this difficult. However, this island was so strategically important that the Americans knew they had to just keep on sending pilots in until they took out these towers. And so in September of that year, the Americans were back to planning another raid over Chichijima Island, and one of the pilots selected to go on this particular raid was a 20-year-old named George, who actually was the youngest pilot in the United States Navy at the time. But despite his age, he had actually flown in several combat missions already, and had actually been shot down already, and had to eject into the ocean, and was subsequently rescued. On the morning of this raid, George, along with his two-man crew, which was his radio operator named Dell and his door gunner named Ted, they boarded the plane, and then at 7.15 a.m., George and his crew took off, along with dozens of other American aircraft that were part of this operation. George immediately climbed above 8,000 feet because that would put them outside of anti-aircraft gun range. And so the way this mission would work is all these pilots would fly over the island and then in order to drop their bombs, they would have to dive down below 8,000 feet and then manually drop their bombs and then try to get back up above 8,000 feet and out away from the island. And so George had run missions like this before, and so he was one of the first to actually make that dive down to the island. And as soon as he went below 8,000 feet, the island just erupted with anti-aircraft gun fire. And so all these rounds are coming up, flak is popping all over the place, and George almost immediately notices the side of his plane gets hit. But the plane's stable enough that he decides he's just gonna keep on diving down and complete the mission. And he's yelling back to Ted and to Dell to hold on, and they get all the way down to 3,000 feet when George releases two 500-pound bombs that are direct hits on the radio tower he was assigned to bomb. But at this point, George's plane is now engulfed in flames. It can barely fly. And so George is again yelling at Ted and Dell to hold on. He's pulling back on the lever and he begins to turn himself away from the tower out towards the water. And he manages to fly away from the island, but he can feel the plane starting to go down. 
Now, George had previously been shot down before, and what he learned from that is how important it was to fly as far away from the enemy as you possibly can before you bail out of your plane. Because if you bail too early and you land in the water right near where the enemy is, you'll just get captured. And so George was holding on to that lever and keeping his plane up as long as he possibly could. And so he's flying and getting lower and lower and lower and closer to the water. And Ted and Dell are yelling at him that they got to jump out. Meanwhile, outside the other planes that had sustained damage, the other American planes, their crews are already bailing out. But George is saying, no, hold on. And he keeps going farther and farther until he's so close to the water that it's practically too late. And then he gives the order to jump out of the plane. George abandons his controls, he leaps out the door, and he hits his head on the back of the plane as he leaps out, but his chute would open up right before he hit the water and it would save his life. As soon as George hits the water and he comes up for air, he's under his parachute. And so he's trying to get his parachute away to get a breath of air. He disconnects his parachute from his shoulders. He clears the parachute and he's looking around and he sees his plane that is now being flown by no one go crashing directly into the water. And so immediately he's looking around for Ted and Dell's parachute to make sure they're okay, but he doesn't see any parachutes anywhere. However, George notices a life raft from his plane had miraculously just landed like 10 feet away from him. So he swims over to the life raft, he climbs inside, and once he's in there, all he's thinking about is Ted and Dell. So he's yelling for Ted, he's yelling for Dell, but he's not getting a response. And so George turns around in the raft, so now he's facing towards the island, and to his horror, way off on the horizon, right near the edge of this island, are Japanese patrol boats that are speeding in his direction. He knows they're coming to get him and the other people that had jumped out of these planes. And so George turns back around, he leaps onto his chest on the front of this raft, and he starts using his hands to swim as fast as he can away from this island. The whole time he's screaming out for Ted and Dell in hopes he's gonna find them. Little did he know that both of them had not survived the crash. One had not even jumped out of the plane and had died on impact, and the other had jumped out, but their parachute had not inflated. And so George is swimming as fast as he possibly can, and he's yelling out for Dell and for Ted, and he's looking, but he doesn't hear them, he doesn't see them, and he knows that not only is he not going to find his friends, but there's just no way he's going to outswim these boats. And so at some point, he just turns around and sits in the raft, and he's looking towards these patrol boats, and he knows that at some point they're going to come up here and they're going to capture him. And all he can think about is how guilty he feels about Ted and Dell. And he starts second guessing his decision to keep that plane flying as long as he did and make them bail out so late. And he's thinking, I probably got them killed. And then he thought about his wife and he wondered if he'd ever see her again. And then he turned towards these Japanese boats that were much closer now, but still fairly far away. And he began mentally preparing himself for captivity. But before he could be captured, American aircraft come storming in overhead and they go flying past him towards the island and they start dropping bombs and strafing these Japanese boats that were coming out to get George. And so George is thinking, oh my goodness, what luck. He turns around, he gets back on his chest and he starts swimming as fast as he can trying to get away knowing that these boats are totally preoccupied with the aircraft overhead. And for two hours, George used every ounce of strength he had to swim as far as he possibly could away from this island. But at some point, he was just so unbelievably exhausted, he just could not paddle any farther. And so he's just laying on this raft when he hears the sound of something coming out of the water. And he turns and he sees the periscope of an American submarine coming out of the water. And seconds later, the crew of this American submarine comes right up alongside him. They grab him out of the raft, they put him in the submarine, and he was saved. Saved. Besides George, Ted, and Dell, there were eight other American airmen that had to bail out of their aircraft because they were badly damaged following this raid. And so originally, those eight people were not recovered and they were believed to have drowned at sea. But that actually was not true. The US government figured out fairly quickly what happened to them, but the details of what happened to them were so gruesome, the government decided they did not want to tell anyone. They especially didn't want to tell the parents and loved ones of these eight airmen because they believed if they heard the true account, that would be too traumatic for them. 
and so they made the details of these eight deaths totally top secret. But 60 years later, in 2004, an author named James Bradley discovered transcripts from a post-World War II Japanese war crimes trial held in Guam, where Japanese military leaders confessed to what they did to these eight captured Americans. This is the true account. Unlike George, these eight other airmen bailed out almost immediately after they got out over the water. And so that placed them in the water very close to the island. And so before the American aircraft could come in and save the day, like they did with George, these eight airmen were scooped up by the Japanese and brought back to the island. The Japanese soldiers on this island for the past several months have been getting constantly bombed by American aircraft, inflicting a very high casualty rate. And so these soldiers hated the Americans and they wanted revenge against the Americans. And so suddenly you have these eight American prisoners on this island with no one to protect them. And so what do you think happens? The Japanese decide they're going to exact their revenge on these eight men. Within 24 hours of being captured, the eight men were kind of huddled up in one section of the island when one of them, Marv Mershon, who was 19 from Long Beach, California, was grabbed by a Japanese commander, stood up and moved to the central area within their military camp and they tied him to a tree and this commander encouraged all of the other soldiers to beat and kick Marv. And so all day long, soldiers were coming up and just beating the crap out of Marv. And Marv is tied to the tree. He can't do anything. And these seven other prisoners are forced to just watch because they can't do anything. And so that night, the same commander comes back and he unties Marv from the tree and he tells these seven other prisoners to stay where they are. And this commander and several other Japanese soldiers, they take Marv and they march him away from the group into the jungle and they march him over to this freshly dug grave. And standing next to the grave that Marv would have seen is this Japanese soldier carrying a sword. And so Marv is told to walk up to the edge of this grave. They tell him to kneel down in front of this grave and they let him smoke a final cigarette. And apparently Marv very calmly smoked the cigarette. And when he was done, the man with the sword put a blindfold on Marv and then told Marv to extend his neck. And as soon as he did, he was beheaded. Afterwards, they buried him inside of this grave. That night, one of the high-ranking Japanese generals on the island, a man named Yoshio Tachibana, who was an alcoholic and was notorious for his sadistic tendencies with prisoners, he was sitting around drinking, having a good time, when he decided that his soldiers, they needed to prove they had what he called the fighting spirit. And the only way they could show they had this fighting spirit was by consuming human flesh. And so Tachibana ordered his soldiers to go exhume Marv from his shallow grave. And then Tachibana sent over one of his surgeons and he told him to remove Marv's thigh. So the surgeon goes over, he surgically removes Marv's thigh. He gives it to one of the cooks and the cooks, they make this huge meal using Marv's thigh and they serve it to Tachibana and his other high ranking officers and some soldiers. And apparently Marv's thigh tasted so good with soy sauce and with sake that Tachibana ordered his soldiers to go back Back and cut more meat off of Marv, which they did. Within a month of Marv's execution and consumption, Tachibana decided that he wanted to eat more human flesh and he wanted his soldiers to eat more human flesh because he and a number of the other officers were superstitious that this could make them stronger and it would be good for their stomach and it would be good for their health. And so they decide they're going to kill more of the American prisoners and eat them. And so they brought the seven remaining American prisoners out to the rifle range. And once they were all out there, one of the Japanese officers grabbed 25-year-old Floyd Hall from Missouri. They pulled him out of the group and they walked him over to the middle of this range and they tied him to a wooden stake in the ground. And once he was in place, Tachibana, who was there, he ordered the other Japanese soldiers to work on their bayonet work on Floyd Hall. And so one by one, these soldiers would go up and plunge their bayonets into Floyd Hall's chest, into his stomach, until he ultimately died. Once he was dead, Tachibana, who had brought along his surgeons for this very reason, he sent them out to remove Floyd's liver and his gallbladder right in front of the now six living prisoners. They're watching this happen right in front of them. And then once his liver and gallbladder have been removed and wrapped in cellophane paper to preserve them, the surgeons walked back and stood on the edge because they knew this was not the last execution of the day. 
And so the other six prisoners are looking around, wondering what's next. And then one of the commanders walks over and he grabs another one of the prisoners. His name was Earl Vaughn. He was 22 years old from Texas. And as soon as he was grabbed, he knew he did not want to face the same fate Floyd did. And so right away, he became defiant. He wanted to die more quickly, and so he began yelling Semper Fi at the Japanese, and he kept extending his neck and pointing up at his neck, indicating he wanted a clean and quick death. Behead me. And so the Japanese, they tried to strap him to this wooden post because they wanted the other soldiers to work on their bayonets with him, but it was just too difficult with Earl. He put up such a fight and he kept putting his neck out that finally one of the soldiers did pull him down and he was beheaded. And then again, the surgeons came running out into the field and in plain sight of the now five remaining American captives, they removed Earl's liver and his gallbladder and then wrapped them in cellophane paper to preserve them. And then they took Floyd and Earl's organs and they went back to the cooks to have them prepared. And that night, all the high ranking officers on the island feasted on Earl and Floyd. Within a few days of Floyd and Earl's murders, the other five captives were also executed in a similar fashion, one by one, in front of their comrades. And two of those remaining five were also consumed. And unfortunately, one of those two was not executed beforehand. Instead, they had pieces of their body surgically amputated, and then those pieces would get cooked and eaten. And when they were done eating them, they would just come back and cut off more and more and more until there was nothing left to eat. And at that point, that prisoner was executed. They did this in order to keep their meat fresh. After the war was over, 34 Japanese soldiers, including General Tachibana, were tried for war crimes for their atrocities they committed against these eight prisoners of war. They were all found guilty and they were all hanged and buried in unmarked graves in Guam. The other men on the island that witnessed these atrocities and didn't do anything about it, or participated but in some sort of secondary way, they were also tried for war crimes, found guilty, and sent to jail, but all of them were released after eight years. George was 80 years old when he finally learned about the atrocities on Chichijima Island that he so narrowly escaped. He, like everyone else that was learning about this, was horrified and disturbed, but more than anything, George felt a deep sense of guilt for having survived. But what we can all say for sure is that George did not waste his second chance at life. George H.W. Bush would go on to become the 41st president of the United States of America, and his son, also named George Bush, would go on to become the 43rd president of the United States of America two world leaders who would change the course of history forever, who never would have been if George Sr. had bailed out of that plane near Chichijima Island just a few seconds earlier. Think about that. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please replace the five-star review button's hand sanitizer with lubricant right before they go out to run some errands. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories I have posted on my YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then just send me a direct message. My username on all of these platforms is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.